Hey guys, welcome back to the big board. So I, I've got uh, something a little bit different to do today. I'm going to try um, try reading. I'm going to very simply uh, going to take uh, a few minutes to read some notes that I made whilst I was playing uh, 1809, uh, seven days of 1809. I wanted to read some stuff primarily because I, I played this game in order to explore how the operational art of war began to evolve uh, over this period between 1806 and 1809. So, uh, you know, I think uh, we've discussed before the, the concept of the warrior, the warrior general, where uh, if you weren't on the horse with a spear or a sword at the very front of the battle, then uh, you weren't a real man and you were uh, probably not going to be king for long. And uh, we saw all the the challenges in command that that, that posed. Uh, we've played dozens and dozens of battles with Great Battles of History and other titles to explore some of, some of that stuff. Uh, not as a means to understand classical strategy, but really because that's just how it was back then. And, well, and the next phase of evolution was this uh, kind of chess-like leader who was back a little bit from the battlefield and as the ranges of weapons improved, the, you know, the leaders were uh, is tending to be back a little bit further. It's a little bit more like a chess, uh, a, ch a chess player than a, uh, than a, a, you know, a classical warrior general type. And you know, direct observation and maneuver are becoming more important. And there are formations running about. And now we have uh, the concept of uh, regiments of units that were combined up into divisions. And I thought the name of the chapter actually came up with that concept. He lived from 1700 to 1780, uh, Pierre Busset, and uh, he uh, reasoned that divisions could run, function as semi-autonomous units. And that, that fundamentally changed a lot of how uh, battle was conducted out in the field uh, with the extended range of artillery and range of musketry as well uh, not very accurate but it had extended range so massed volleys were used so that as that all became more relevant that really meant that you know, lots and lots of divisions were being piled onto a road and jammed down uh, down a, a highway or a roadway or a trail or through the forest, whatever the case may be, with their supply train uh, following behind, which would be you know dozens and dozens or hundreds of wagons full of stuff. Or if you're the French, you're foraging uh, and trying to be efficient that way. The French were particularly good at that. Uh, so uh, over that uh, course of time, I'm just looking here at my notes that I wanted to uh, make sure I mentioned here. Things became fairly balanced. It, you, you could tell where all these divisions were going, and you could either accept battle or not accept battle. And most of the time, if the conditions were favorable, then one side or the other would say, "Well, I'm out of here," and they would start marching. And you would always basically know where the other uh, army was going, or was going, or was potentially going to be. And it really wasn't until uh, the concept of cause were. Uh, evolved or created where and balanced corps as well so we had artillery infantry and cavalry almost a standalone army uh, which Napoleon really uh, took advantage of uh, from from uh, a, a tactical perspective because that allowed him to have a greater sense of maneuver and move further and faster than his contemporaries so with that in mind and the concept of the general headquarters, uh, the headquarter structure was really interesting in the in the early early part of this century. Uh, let me just read a little bit here to you. This uh, this concept, the general headquarters, uh, the centralized kind of imperial system, uh, worked for Napoleon versus code leadership. So. If you looked at the Austrians, they would have a king who would uh, often have to defer to a set of generals or a council or whatever the case may be. And uh, it was um, not particularly efficient, nor was it, it was, it's like trying to run a business by committee, right? You're going to uh, often choose the uh, common denominator solution that is not necessarily the best solution. Whereas with this imperial approach that Napoleon took, 
for all that it wasn't uh, uh, systematic in its approach, it was certainly autocratic and it gave him uh, the ability to get things done incredibly quickly and people trusted in him enough that they would go and execute against his orders and desires and had built up the logistical capabilities to supply and provision and uh, deliver uh, all of these forces uh, to where they wanted, where the, he wanted them to be at that time. Uh, and I think also during this time, I'm not sure, but uh, during this time, I think also that the French were first to uh, uh, in place or put into place uh, conscription. So that allowed them to recruit massive armies who weren't particularly experienced, but uh, or capable for that matter. But once you start to inter interleave them with other forces and other fo uh, and formations and put uh, you know better NCOs and better uh, uh, leaders and commanders in in with those weaker units you built up a massive army very very quickly uh, and also you uh, you national uh, I think there was a nationalization of weapons manufacturers so you had people making uh, uh, muskets and cannons and stuff all over the place all throughout the countryside uh, right so it was interesting in the play of uh, 1806 Rosbach avenged my play, you know, forces were very spread out over a, a wide area, and even the corps were kind of spread out. I was running things around uh, division by division, but even during that battle, there were a lot of miscommunications with the uh, the, the various corps. So the actual the lack of system of communication with Napoleon caused problems, and there was a. Uh, you know, perhaps a lack of uh, enthusiasm with some of his leaders. There was particularly uh, an instance between Bernadotte and Davout. They had issues, uh, you know, both forces are crossing paths. Uh, units, some units had no orders for three days. And uh, there was very little uh, inter-core uh, communication. So what this lack of syst systemic uh, communication amongst the army as a whole and the corps uh, discreetly you know, what's core three doing and what's core four doing and where are they headed and what are their objectives and what are they doing? There was a very little of that. It was, we'll get back to you. Napoleon will send you a runner and you'll know what's going on. Uh, but you were to be uh, in keeping him informed, right? Uh, so let's try and get down to the point here or some of the more points here. Uh, so. Uh, Napoleon was also uh, very active on the field, so he had eyes and ears on the field, but he also was uh, mobile and almost a 24-7 kind of guy. He was uh, you know, out in the field, in, in a, you know, on his horseback, on horseback or in carriage uh, all day, and then when in the evening, uh, late in the evening, 11, 10 or 11 at night, is when he would... Uh, do a lot of his planning around the maps and uh, and issue orders, and those orders were incredibly efficiently uh, delivered. So uh, through a means, you know, set of couriers and things like that. So it was pretty interesting. So this uh, uh, decentralized and uh, a decentralized organization uh, meant it was difficult for him to keep track of everything, but he did a pretty good job of it as as an individual. Obviously, over time, uh, other armies began to adopt some of his uh, methods, the core method and all these other bits and pieces, but we'll get to that also in just a second. Uh, and I think the, one of the points from the book, one of the books I was reading was, reading was that um, Napoleon realized the limits of the technology he had available to him. There was no telegraph, there was no telephone. The, he recognized the limits of the weaponry. He recognized the capabilities to maneuver. He understood the terrain he was fighting on, uh, typically. And all of that gave him uh, an edge over his competitors because he, he didn't let the lack of communication or the speed at which someone, some force moved restrain him. He worked with it to the best of his ability. I, I, I really liked that explanation of one of the key characteristics of why he was different versus others. Okay, uh, <clears throat> now these headquarters had, uh, Napoleon's headquarters had several different levels to it, which I 
completely unaware of. I did not know any of this detail. So uh, I may make this a separate section, we'll see. But um, And if it's not interesting, then fast forward however long this takes. The concept was that uh, there was a household staff, a general staff, an administrative headquarters, and uh, those were comprised of uh, the, the maison was the household or the cabinet. And that had the secretariat, which was uh, mainly archivists, uh, a topographical uh, bureau, and uh, it's just a statistical bureau, which was really an intel gathering uh, service. So it was a combination of feed on the street research and uh, spying, and it was uh, generally diplomatically collected data and information and map and as map assessments and all this sort of stuff, uh, campaign mapping and distilling data down and all these sorts of good things. So um, lots and lots of data collected and uh, archived, and that gave the French an ability to have a pretty well informed opinion of. Where th what the current status quo may have been based on historical data that they had. So the second part, uh, the general staff, was where all the uh, orders from Napoleon that were issued were expanded upon and written out in perhaps more detail that he might than he may have uh, issued, and uh, and also all of the detailed orders that needed to happen that would go in conjunction with that. So if a force was ordered to move then uh, you know what uh, the uh, commissary needed to know where they were going how far they would be going uh, how long it would take them to get there and what well, they had to get provisions to those folks uh, wherever they were going as well so uh, interesting to, to know that uh, and then obviously uh, all the administrative stuff all the administrative all the uh, you know password of the day and stuff like that uh, uh, so and, and that then kind of tied into the admin headquarters a little bit where there were the logistics and the uh, establishment of magazines around uh, either around the country or around the terrain that you were particularly that you were going to be maneuvering through as well so that were the three core pieces of the, the uh, general headquarters um, So earlier on, I talked about the regiment. There's a little bit more detail here that I missed. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, the regiment was this was the largest formation that, uh, that was in existence at the time, um, in which units were collected together. So I'd always wondered about that. Actually, you know, all the the, the Napoleonic forces were represented as. You know, regiment A, B, C, D, and E, and had their color regimental colors, and they had their flags and all this sort of stuff. And there was a lot of pride in the you know, the English and the French and the Austrians and Prussians and the Russians and all those guys in their regiments, not in their divisions or their corps, because there really weren't any at that time. So that that was uh, uh, I just had always assumed that at some point earlier in the classical era that the concept of divisions were used. Uh, and the regiments were just a subunit, just a naturally occurring subunit. The uh, so regiments uh, which were grouped into brigades or bundled into columns. So if we look at uh, Austerlitz is a great example. I was a little confused when I first played that game uh, in the uh, Napoleonic battle series. It used the concept of columns and of wing, you know, the left wing, the right wing, and uh, I might have noted this here in the center. Uh, in the center column, center wing, it's not really a wing, is it, to center. And so uh, Austerlitz had that type of terminology and then just uh, you know a handful of years later when then using the uh, divisional uh, and core uh, concepts. So that was a inter interesting to see how that matured away from uh, this left wing, right wing classical concept to the more modern operational ideas around uh, grouping units together. All right, so uh, wings of cavalry, wings of infantry, slow and cumbersome and unwieldy, we got into that idea. So so then, with that, so the problem we talked about earlier on was trying to have all these these regiments you know, racing down the road and you, the biggest your army could be was 50 or 60,000 people. And, uh, it, and it was easy to uh, end up with an indecisive result in a battle because you, you would just march your guys away and decline the battle typically because you didn't have enough force uh, able to be brought to bear in one location to force the matter uh, and, and make someone fight on terms they didn't want to fight in. 
which if you're the leader or the emperor or the king or the duly appointed uh, leader not good for your political future if you're not able to have a decisive victory particularly if that's the point of having warfare right uh, so uh, merely uh, merely forcing withdrawals could often win a campaign for you if you thought the situation was untenable as the defender you withdraw or as the attacker you can't win you withdraw the other guy wins no one really lost any guys there wasn't a lot of attrition no one died but the other dude ran away so you won let's see so in 1732 uh, I may pronounce this incorrectly but uh, yeah so here we go so the Saxe S A X E uh, wrote uh, about uh, and, an ex and, and just, just started experimenting with uh, during the Seven Years War of grouping four regiments together and in 1763 the division was born so that's the that's the official the official year and it was typically uh, two brigades uh, four regiments uh, and some arty uh, attached artillery and uh, you can see some of that in some of the Napoleonic battle series titles and some of the OSG titles operational studies group titles that, that's how um, that's how the armies are formed kind of from that time onwards uh, so these uh, these divisions uh, as we mentioned could act as semi-independent units and it allowed a lot, a lot more flexibility in terms of flanking maneuver uh, and it would make you know would make uh, having avoiding battle more difficult. <coughs> so, so now we finally got to the point where with divisions and then ultimately with corps that we can tie the political objective to a military one and force the issue. And that is one of the key things that drove Napoleon, I think, to uh, be so innovative with this this uh, with the usage of corps. Uh, this forced, uh, interestingly enough, this forced a uh, change at the battalion level, uh, the tactics, uh, the improvement in cannon technology also had an impact on the French approach to doing battle. Uh, I mentioned uh, conscription, the French Revolution, uh, so that was in fact uh, during this time the French Revolution uh, ushered in the concept of con conscription, uh, the levy en masse. Uh, idea and so by 1794 there were a million men in France mobilized uh, and they were manufacturing the French were manufacturing a thousand muskets a day which is pretty amazing for back in those times right uh, this obviously had uh, a serious impact upon you know the officer class as well because now you needed so many more officers and uh, it uh, it changed the way the French ran their army all right uh, what else do I want to say here? Oh, and so uh, Moreau uh, was ordered to create uh, the first French corps in 1800 on March the 1st. Uh, and that was to be, uh, a corps was to be comprised of four divisions of infantry, one division of cavalry, and a battery of uh, artillery per, di per, uh, per division. Um, And so Napoleon was one of the first guys to envision these strategically decisive campaigns and, and bring multiple divisions together to create the concept of corps. And then I wanted to talk about, was that it? I think that was it. The, so with that in mind, uh, as we've looked at the photographs of the battle for you know 1809 the seven days uh, of 1809 um, you, I think you can see pretty clearly how now that I understood more accurately how cores worked or were intended to work uh, by keeping them uh, uh, slightly closer together and uh, within command range of Napoleon and command range of uh, DeVoe and others and Messina who had the ability to activate cores without having to do the, the die roll. Uh, that, uh, that allowed a, a lot more operational flexibility for the French than it did for the Austrians. The Austrians started out real strong and maneuvered very quickly and were really headed towards, uh, I think it's Regensburg, I don't, uh, I don't have the map in front of me at the moment, it's over there. But, um, you're not going to see me pointing you won't know where over there is so hopefully I'll edit 
that part out. Uh, what we what we were able to do with the Austrians was maneuver fairly effectively and actually put a lot of pressure on DeVoe's third corps and really start to push him back and away from uh, the Regensburg area and cap eventually capture Regensburg but not before uh, Messina arrived and Napoleon uh, then brought together uh, I think it was Udine and um, Lane and one other one other um, core. So we had three core there, and we really were able to very su not subtly. That's not the right word I want to use. Uh, what's the right word? We were able to begin what looked like we were pushing one way with the uh, with uh, some of the cores, and then redirect and strike really heavily and aggressively and really smacked uh, hard into the third core of the Austrian forces. We wiped it out almost entirely. And in fact, I probably should have kept better track of the uh, core losses there because that would have demoralized that force uh, fairly quickly and, changed, and I think sped up the conclusion of the game a little bit. And then the, the losses started to mount up for Charles, uh, Archduke Charles after that fairly quickly. Uh, there's another let me just see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, the the sixth core, the sixth core, all, the sixth core also took a pounding as well, and uh, because Charles was trying to push right across the the uh, the uh, a fairly long and extended front. Uh, but did not have the operational flexibility because of his command structure and the command ratings. The command ratings are those for all of his leaders, unless they're within range of him, uh, they're going to have to roll to activate. And although they have good activation ratings, they didn't always activate. So we'd end up with these uh, these gaps in, in the activations and uh, for the turns. And it would cause all sorts of havoc for him trying to maneuver and keep, a, uh, keep the lines of communication consistent and keep forces together because some would move and some wouldn't uh, keeping in mind right that with these core activations if the leader fails each individual unit can then subsequently roll to activate he can move a certain distance if that happens so we were doing that using those rules um, so it made it for a bit of a mess and the French were able to take advantage of that because they had so many leaders that can activate uh, uh, and activate easily and so Napoleon was able to bring them together and although we did uh, in use the use the Imperial Guard uh, probably fairly early uh, we used them in good effect and paid the victory point uh, cost I think there's a victory point cost for it not really interested in who won it was more it's very obvious who won but uh, it was uh, an interesting exercise in in maneuver is what I was curious about and how that how power could be brought to bear uh, so efficiently and effectively in this and it happened at first I thought the, the Austrians were going to run amok with all this and really uh, uh, stick it to the French the French took a fair bit of a beating uh, DeVos uh, third corps took a, a bit of a pounding and others uh, had some reductions as well so it was a fairly tight thing until probably the 22nd, so quite near the end of the afternoon, maybe the morning of the 22nd, that those two turns and the subsequent turn, the morning turn on the 23rd, really saw the tables turning pretty heavily against uh, maybe the 21st, actually 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Um, those two and a quarter days there really saw the uh, the, the Austrians uh, uh, stretch very thin. Anyway, so that's uh, that's my experience and exposure to the beginnings of the uh, concepts around uh, the operational art of war, you know, general the general concept of the general headquarters, how those matured over time, and unfortunately, I have not been able to find an interesting title or a title at the right scale that gives us a look at. Uh, Kind of what happened uh, post Waterloo, and uh, you know the lessons that Moltke learned from uh, Napoleon, and the improvements that the Prussians made upon uh, the operational art of war, and the, the concept of the general headquarters. The Prussians became very, um, very scientific with their uh, application of 
uh, Nepal, the lessons from Napoleon. As as we saw at, at Vagram, uh, you know, Napoleon had met his match and hadn't ad did not continue to adapt as the Austrians had adapted uh, to fighting against uh, fighting against uh, Napoleon. They were able to mass their forces just as Napoleon was at Wagram. So, which is you know not long down the timeline from this uh, battle we just fought here. So, uh, not much on the multi multi era era, I should say, uh, 1860 period is what I'm looking for. So, if you know any titles uh, that you think might work for us, so we can explore what was going on there, uh, we'll do that. Uh, otherwise, we'll perhaps just uh, post up a little bit of video on on that particular uh, era and time and the approaches to running and managing an army that were used back in those days. So fairly long diatribe, hopefully it was, uh, it will be uh, of some interest to someone. All right, later guys.